Then Brian's going to talk about the importance of guidance. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about our open assignments desk that we're working on and how we think some of those ideas would be valuable to other organizations as well. And then we'll end with a Q&A. A quick background on myself and Brian. Um, Brian and I have been working together under the banner of Small World News since 2006. And we've worked in a number of different locations um, with a number of different partners, all focused on media projects. Um, the first five years, it was all uh, conflict zone focused content creation. Uh, the last five years, we've been doing training and guide creation. And that has led us to develop this app called Storymaker. So before we really get into that though, I just wanna go over a couple ideas about user-generated content because there's a lot of vocabulary, but I just wanna talk about it in very plain, simple terms. And there's the crowd and there's the industry. And the distinction in my mind between those two are people who get paid and people who do not get paid. If you get paid, you're in the industry. I don't care if you're a stringer or whatever, it doesn't matter, you're in that block. And if you are on Twitter and you're just doing stuff to do stuff, you're in the crowd and that's awesome. And there's not necessarily a bad side or a good side, there's just differences. Uh, the advantage of the crowd is open participation and spontaneity. You know, Jan 25 starts, that just happens and people jump in and you can participate. The clear winners of this are clearly Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. That's what comes to mind when we think about social media and user-generated content for the last five years, 10 years. From the industry side, you have you know, editorial oversight and you have, have exclusivity. And you know, some clear examples of like industry leaders who have done really good things in the last 10 years, you know, BBC, CNN, Guardian Witness, have all been doing things with UGC in an interesting way that they're trying to engage with their audience. Um, I would say in terms of these two, this, these two sides of the same coin, you need to think about how they've maybe not succeeded as well as they could. And so when you think about the fails on both sides, user-generated content that's in control from, you know, when the crowd is totally in control and has no editorial oversight, they make mistakes and they put people at risk. And the police have to warn people and say, hey, you can't report on police locations because that's really dangerous. The media understands that, the crowd doesn't. But on the other hand, you know, like this image, as you can see with Obama reading interviews from Twitter, that's not good television. I'm sorry, watching people read Twitter is terrible television. And it's an interesting idea, but it's not it's not the best way to use that tool in that medium. And the, our sort of approach is, the, what we're trying to advocate for today is finding balance between the crowd and the industry and finding a level playing field where both sides can bring their advantages while letting the other side do what they do best. And that's collaboration. And some really good examples of that right now are, you know, everyone's talking about Periscope and Meerkat. The advantages, just in raw terms, of what that's interesting to the, to the industry is, it's real-time content. Why is real-time content awesome? Because you are seeing it happen live and you don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, and what's really exciting about Meerkat or Periscope, just as a basic feature, is you can actually comment to the person while they're filming it. So if you said turn left, it's completely practical that that person holding the camera could actually turn left. That's way more exciting than watching a CNN feed from Ferguson, because you have no interaction with the cameraman. So I think those are the two things that make it really interesting as a piece of technology. And again, though, the crowd is still really in control there. Um, and then what's you know, a really good example of the industry uh, really engaging has been Twitter. You know, journalists are great at using Twitter. Not every journalist is, but plenty of them are. And it allows them to function with a level of transparency and verification that I would say most journalists haven't had ever before. Um, so really, I just wanted to kind of go over that broad overview to 
so that for the rest of the, this conversation, we can discuss things in terms of there's the crowd, there's the industry, and then how do we actually facilitate better collaboration between those two. Um, so, Brian, turn it over to you and talk about the importance of guidance. Yeah, so I think um, the one thing we want to make really clear is that we're talking about this from the lens of our experience training journalists and building a tool called Storymaker, but we're really hoping that, you know, we can sort of make some of our points and then kind of really have a discussion about, you know, is this worthwhile? What can we do to improve the collaboration between journalists and the audience and citizen journalists and freelancers, even within your own staff, how can we do that better? Do you want to sh just show them? We've got plenty of time. Yeah, I mean, we can show the video. Um, how do I? So Sto this is just a, a basically a, the fastest way we can kind of tell you the story of what Storymaker is. Yeah. Storymaker is an app that transforms your phone into a powerful storytelling tool. In Libya, Zimbabwe, and across the world, we are seeing users creating compelling stories with just a few hours of practice. Designed by a group of trainers with years of experience working in the field, Storymaker is the tool you need to learn how to be a journalist while staying safe and creating great stories. Whether it's a photo series, an audio story, or a video package, Storymaker walks you through what you need to know in order to be successful. Our templates provide suggested narrative arcs and potential questions to give you structure, but leave you enough room to tell the story you want. Professional images have a look to them that can be difficult for newcomers to recreate, but with Storymaker's innovative overlays, it's easy to make sure your interview looks the way you think it should when it matters the most, at the point of production. Storymaker has editing built in. You can simply arrange your clips in a new order, or you can trim them to be just the way you want. Storymaker even makes it easy to record your own narration to go with your story. When your story is ready, you can share it across all of your favorite platforms straight from Storymaker. By partnering with experts in security, Storymaker allows you to publish videos to YouTube, even if it's being blocked. Storymaker has access to a 55 lesson course in journalism, security, photo, audio, and video production. So when you're ready to dive deep and learn everything you can, we have the lessons to get you started. Storymaker works because our team is filled with trainers with years of experience, people who have been in the field and know how to break complex ideas down into easy to follow instructions. Storymaker is the ultimate tool for multimedia production on your mobile phone. Available now in the Google Play Store. So that's, um, that's kind of the, the first version of Storymaker. And when we built Storymaker, we're really coming from perspective as, as trainers and people who are you know, hired to go to a place and in a matter of a very few days teach all the video production basics from how to hold a camera to how to edit and assemble a piece. And what we were finding is that we spent a huge amount of time just on the technical skills, and we didn't have enough time to do, to focus on storytelling and actually how to put those skills to use in a practical way, in an interesting way, creating better content. So with the, the second version of Storymaker, which was just released publicly a few weeks ago, we've tried to focus on, rather than having simply templates and lessons, making things that are a little more granular, more interactive, or more modular. So, so. So the, the, first, the first focus was on figuring out how to provide simple direction that is not just one direction, but you know, evolves, getting some input from the user, telling the user, okay, based on those things that you say you want to do, here's some other things you'd like to do. Um, you know, it's similar to what we've seen with, with CNN and the BBC and, and folks who are saying, hey, are you at this location? Send us a photo or a video or tell us what you're seeing. That's a one-way communication that you're saying, give me this one thing and you're getting it, or maybe you're not getting it. By increasing more direction, you can actually get follow-up and get really specifically the right things, okay? We want you to talk to any women between this age and this age who you know, were affected by postpartum depression, right? And we're gonna make a, get a video of it by sort of saying, here's a template for how to shoot the video. We know you've never shot a video before, just make it look like this. Now, while direction is really good for you, the content, you know, the person trying to get the content, right? If I want to get content from a certain place, I've got to give good direction to the person who wants, I want to give it to me. 
tips are a thing that continue to help the user, you know, and they will help the user on the next time they make a video, even if it's for someone else, if it's for themselves, if it's a, a home movie, you know, if it's a video at a party. That's the point of, of tips is to provide free advice and sort of give the user a lot more benefit, right? So w we were actually really surprised, you know, when we put out version two, we added tips just as an idea. And what we found in the first workshops and use cases, people were like, oh, the tips are the most important thing. And then we were like, oh, okay. Like, it, it became obvious once people were saying that. But to us, the tips are like, that is what you do as a trainer, right? What you're able to do is like work with someone, they give you work, and if you're really experienced, you can give them more tailored advice. The tips, you know, kind of feel like t advice that's t personally tailored to me and give me that thing where it's not just requesting something, but it's actually saying, here's the thing you can do better. And it's doing it before they've given you the content. That's the other thing that's really important, you know? When we were running projects in Iraq and in Mexico and these kind of video projects during the first half of our, our lifetime over the last 10 years, um, we would get content, we'd have to make the best use of it we could, and then we'd be like, oh, here's a pointer for next time. You know, and, and you have to often make that point multiple times before it gets through. When the tip and the guidance is there right as the user's doing it, you have a much higher likelihood that they're gonna get it right. And then finally, you know, there are, there are goals, you know, which is to say, at the exact moment before the user clicks record or right after the user has clicked save, make sure they have a reference point to say, oh, this piece of content is supposed to do this. This is the number one thing I'm doing right here. If you're only asking for a single piece of content, your direction and your goal might be the same. But if you're trying to create a, a series of, of things, you wanna have you know, one, pe one clip, one goal to really make it clear to the user. You know, we, we find that people, it gives them a good reference point that even if they've never done it before, they can do a thing and then say, oh, right, I did that, or oh, wait, right, and then they do it again. All this together you know, comes into something that in StoryMaker we call a story path. Story path is just a kind of our term for talking about a modular, interactive, or semi-interactive assignment. Um, I don't know if I should say about this stuff. I mean, anything I miss? The is that video playing? Yeah, no, it is. So as you can see in the video, this is a screencast of a whole story path that we that's available inside of StoryMaker, and this just walks somebody through all of the individual pieces of content that could be used, or that would make up an event story. And this is just one example of many different paths that are available. And the, I, th I think in terms of how StoryMaker approaches this stuff is, yeah, we create story paths and we find that to be interesting, but in terms of anyone who's trying to get you better user-generated content, what we're just trying to advocate for is don't just put out one sentence and assume that your users who've never maybe never really created a piece of content before are going to give you what you expect of them. So the more you can give, the better you're going to get. Right. And, and I mean, even after just a, a few weeks of, of working with version two, we're finding already that, you know, we created this one thing that was, okay, people told us before the assignments that are in StoryMaker 1 are too static and they don't give me enough information. Even this new version where I have what, I think 50 different ass like assignments I can get by saying, okay, I'm gonna make a story about an event, I'm gonna talk to people about it, it's gonna be an audio story. I get some tailored pieces, but once I've done that a few times, I'm already ready to get something more specific, right? Unless I'm there really as a student. And I think it, you know, what we have right now will work really well for media trainers and for people who are trying to train their staff to do more things and give them examples, but we need more modular assignments, right? And that's where we're really sort of looking at, okay, how do we make something that is based on something that you need, right? If I'm a student and I'm a trainer, or I'm a trainee, it's obvious to me why I want to use StoryMaker. It's gonna tell me how to make it better. If, if, but, but then I have to really want that, you know? Whereas an assignment it says, okay, you're doing this because you want to submit content to CNN and you want to be part of this thing or you want to do it for this advocacy organization, et cetera. So we have a YouTube channel, and it's, you know, if you look up StoryMaker, it's, uh, it's in there. Uh, I forget the exact URL. It's one of those crazy YouTube things. But 
Um, if anyone would like it, I'll be I'll be sure to tweet it out. The but we have a we curate all of the different stories that people are making with Storymaker. Uh, I just pulled a whole bunch of like cross sections just to show what I find really interesting in terms of what Storymaker is able to do with UGC is we get more than one piece of content, and more often than not, we get content that has a variety of styles inside of it, meaning different shot sizes and different questions being asked and all those different kinds of ideas. Whereas I think uh, most people would agree that UGC in, in the traditional sense is individual bite-sized pieces of content. And so we're just trying to, you know, I think this is a very new and big challenge to go from one piece to many pieces, but we think there's a lot of opportunity there and we're probably not gonna be the only ones who are solving this. We wanna hear other ideas as well. Yeah, and just to be clear, you know, we have a, the YouTube channel Steve's talking about is a playlist. If folks are publishing their content to their own channel, and these variety of platforms you see here that you can publish different types of content to. Uh, you've got different formats, you even have the ability to kind of export the entire project as a zip. That's one of the things we're working on. Yeah. And, and just sort of, you know, and what I was saying earlier, there's some other really interesting apps that are following the same mentality of, how do we help someone who wants to contribute content? How do we make sure we're giving them everything that they need? And StoryCore just put out a great app which gives you the option to choose from a whole range of questions so that you can construct an interview with you know, someone, a loved one, or someone you find interesting. And Videolicious is going after uh, building products very tailor-made for uh, like first-tier news publishers and they're doing everything very proprietary. And they're doing a lot of really awesome, interesting things. But they take this mentality of, you have to really structure it for people. And so, you know, it's, and these are just two of, you know, a lot of other people out there as well. Um, so that kind of just talks about, that, well, that last section ends with just sort of the idea that, okay, giving people structured guidance is really helpful. And in terms of an example of, the idea of creating a story assignment. This is a, just a screenshot of a recent um, story assignment on the Guardian Witness app. And they give you one single direction and they ask for one single file. And so one card, one, one goal, gives you one clip story. And, but if you give more, you can get more. So for preparing for this talk, uh, Brian and I wrote a story path for creating IJF uh, personal bios of people in attendance. And uh, we have a couple phones and we'd be happy to lend one out to anybody who wants to play with the app and give us some feedback. And we're gonna be putting it out, I think later today, so that people, if you download StoryMaker on your Android phone, you can actually play around with it. I know there's a lot of iPhone users. That's cool, we like iPhone, we just don't have the funds to support iOS right now. But uh, if anyone would like to play with it, we have some devices, and I'm happy to, to lend one to you. Um, so, but this is a this is some concrete examples of what we would say is an example of what a story path would look like for this, and you know, ask a very targeted question and give a very clear piece of direction. Help us complete short video stories of other attendees at IJF 15. That's going to be if I'm not there. Well, I'm not going to get involved, and so there's. This is a couple screenshots of what the path looks like. But in terms of the actual raw content, there are 17 different cards inside of that path that are providing either direction, a goal, or a tip at a different time. And that's to really make sure that whoever's going through that process knows that we're kind of there to give them the next piece of advice. And what that would, you know, so the results of going through each of these 17 cards, we end up with you know, six pieces of direction, seven goals, and four tips. And what that creates is a seven clip story. And for you know, another really clear thing I wanna make understood is we know that the, a lot of people in the industry don't like to get edited content from the crowd. Uh, they want the raw content so they can make tweaks, they can use it how they need to, to use it. And that's why we support the zip format so that people can, when we deliver the content, you can get it and still tweak it if that's what you wanna do with it. 
Um, but the, for the users who are delivering it to their own platforms to say YouTube, YouTube doesn't want a zip file, they want a raw finished file. And so we're trying really hard to make sure that we're giving the tools to both people who are using it for a newsroom environment, but also for a crowd environment where you're dealing with different platforms. And just as an example, this was a, a video we shot just a little bit ago. Hi, my name is Giacomo, and I'm working for the IJF. IJF. Uh, here at IJF, I'm working as an editor. I'm doing some quick interview to the people who's uh, doing the panels and stuff, and I'm going to edit on the fly for the It's amazing. <laughs> and so, again, as a standalone piece, it's uh, it's very short. But as a collection of a number of interviews with different people, you know, you might want to say, well, that last question was better, or the first question was better, and I want to use that piece, and I want to use this piece. And by having different people creating these different pieces of content and being able to recontextualize them, we think you'll you'll have more chance of success of creating better content from users. Well, and, and we believe that um, encouraging users to tell stories, not just to send you the one thing that you want, is going to make your ability to get input and, and access to the audience better. People are going to be more likely to engage because they'll see a benefit to them. Um, and here's another example. But um, again, this is sort of the raw content at the bottom and one of the finished pieces at the top. And, you know, so in comparison, you know, the traditional model is, you know, one piece of direction with one goal. And we're just really trying to advocate that when you give more to the audience, you're definitely going to get more from the audience. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the big thing that we're finding is that well, there's always going to be a place for journalists and for the work that journalists do. We'd rather see it have access to more primary source material rather than less. And then we think actually more and more people are able to tell stories and to create stories. So we'd like to make it easier for news agencies to benefit from that work. Um, so yeah, so the final s section, just question and answers. Um, some of the open questions that we have just in terms of, you know, we still haven't solved all the problems. We've been working on this for a few years, but there's still a lot to go. Um, but if you guys have other questions that you find interesting, by all means, you know we're here and um, let's talk. Please. Brian. I, I've got, um, I've got really, a, this was a technical question. I've only just downloaded the app, so I don't know it yet. But I was wondering, um, would it be possible, do you have planned um, some means whereby um, users would actually be able to create guidance notes themselves or templates? Yeah, that's kind of the, the whole goal of, of the assignment desk functionality is to say, okay, we've got an app that has all these features, but in order to make it a lot more effective, we need an assignment desk, you know, it, we're calling an assignment desk because that's familiar to news agencies, but anybody, right, to have the ability to go online, make a story path for themselves, or share it, you know, with anyone else using StoryMaker. And, you know, right now, just due to the technical way that things have progressed, we've been the gatekeepers on the story paths. But that's one of those things that we really want to get out of the way of as quickly as possible. We want to be able to say, hey, you want to make a really interesting template for shooting the best dog video? By all means, go do that. If you want to make one for, you know, a birthday party, we want to open that up to see what ideas that people have because we think that's what's going to make that format really flourish. Yeah, this is one of our key questions for all of you is, is, you know, what kind of paths would be helpful? What kind of assignments do you make knowing that it's going to be mobile based? You know, it's going to be mobile first. What do you think that the reach is there? Yes, you know, I can take this camera and it's Wi-Fi enabled. I can copy it to my phone, but most users are going to just be using a phone. But so that's the question, you know, what, what kind of content do you think you'd be making? You know, what kind of content do you think you would use from other folks? What do you see as the current limitations? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's a great example. Like one of uh, something that I've wanted to do for a long time is one of the example videos we used to do in training was to find a local bread maker. And it's just a very structured story to tell as far as you shoot this piece and then you shoot that piece. And it would be awesome to have an anthropo anthropological collection of different bread making across the globe. That would be super interesting. And I think there's a number of different facets as well. One of our, our CTO, his wife is a scientist at Berkeley. And what she's really interested in using it for is helping her students have structured media creation for documenting different parts of their research. And so in terms of the format and the flexibility of giving this structured uh, assignment, it's really useful for news, but it's also actually as valuable for other people as well. Sir? So I'm gonna ask a double-barreled question, which is Please. what I don't teach my students, but I'll ask it anyway. So first question would be is, um, why the decision to go Android first as opposed to iOS first? And if you guys are either happy with that decision or regret that decision. <laughs> uh, so in this room, I regret that decision. But in terms of why Android, uh, the initial decision was made due to first security reasons. Uh, our initial funding and came through. And what the funder wanted. Yeah, our <laughs> funding came through a security focus grant and our uh, one of our technical partners is the Guardian Project, and they're most familiar with working on Android. They've recently moved to iOS for a couple of projects. But yeah, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, more than, what, 80 or 90 percent of the world's smartphones are Android. Yeah. However, a large portion of the world's journalists are iOS users. Yeah. So, you know, the folks that we're reaching, though, are people who want training and need training, and they're going to be on Android, especially overseas. Even in the United States, communities of color are more likely to have Android. People who have been outside of the, the mainstream media are also more likely to use Android devices. Yeah. And I'm, I'm ask Please. A set of questions. Um, I don't know if you've talked to Madeline Baer from Witness or Witness.org, um, if you're familiar with that organization. But yeah. If you've talked to her, um, I was wondering if uh, a part of the process that you guys are doing would include keeping the metadata to the content and then keeping it extended towards the finished product, mainly because if the UG content is, is submitted as a witness right. to an event, that could be, just makes it easier for, thing, for people to verify that it, this is being witnessed at the actual event. Right, and so the project that Witness is working on to do that is the Informicam project. Right, and uh, Crazy we're- Witness mode. We're very good friends with the developers Super. who are doing that. What's really interesting is where we're trying to kind of, both projects are very different, but they're obviously very complementary for the reasons you pointed out. And the interesting thing just in terms of, there's a, a fairly te big technical amount of, it's a lot of technical work to make that marriage be as seamless as user would, users would expect it to be. But, yeah. um, yeah, there's, there's some question, once you're doing more than submitting evidentiary material or a raw content, there's some question about how best to have a chain of custody, how to continue that, you know. Should I upload to YouTube, and at the same time, I'm sending the metadata to a secure server? Is it a partnership with YouTube? A lot of that stuff is still not worked out, as far as I understand, which I'm pretty sure is why Informicam is not, like, a publicly accessible tool still. Yeah. And they've been working on it for a few years. Well, they're yeah. trying, they're really trying hard to make Informacam be the standard of metadata. I mean, the, ACL, the ACLU is on board as verifying it for a use in court. And that's a really nice, you know, that's an important project that we do not have time to work on. But when they are ready and able to start integrating with other apps, that's when we're basically, you know, we're on the same email list as them. So as soon as they're ready to, uh, jump on, it's gonna be like, cool, let's do this. Um, and what's, what's, what gets really interesting, sorry, um, just go down a rabbit hole real quick, I'll keep it very short. But um, what's really interesting about metadata in a story is how do you verify not only the total collection of all, say, 10 clips in a story, but how do you also verify each clip individually and say, these clips, this was produced at this point because the best, the best piece of video to start your story with might not have been shot first. 
And so you're, that's where the technical amount of, uh, the technical achievement to make all of that quote unquote just work is that's where they're really doing an, an insane amount of work and it's really impressive what they have already done, but that's sort of the, the next barrier for us to really say like, oh yeah, this format's gonna be really, really useful and valuable to us. Um, but it's definitely on our mind and something we, you know, talk, talk about quite a lot. Because it's as, you know, in terms of the legal case, the other side of it is, you know, newsrooms want veracity. They want to know this content was actually produced at this time. And there's a lot of great projects out there that I would say are doing that in an analog way. And we'll, you know, we've all got our fingers crossed that Informa can will solve that from a technical level. Yeah, thank you. But you're just really talking about like the meta, the geolocation data. We're talking about geotagging. Or yeah, more well, so but if I have a clip, and my mobile phone's going to give me geolocation every time I shoot it if I've got that on. But when I upload it, I may have a different, you know, and the exported video won't have that. And so it's, you know. Right, a finished piece won't, but the, each piece has its own EXIF data. Or something. <laughs> right. Right, it could come over as a layer, a data layer. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. but in terms of, the, the InformaCam project brings significant more amount of geo data. So it actually scrapes your, um, the, the phone for all of the cell phone towers that it's connected to, and as well as the local Wi-Fi access points that are visible, and it takes all of that and creates a hash out of it. Um, I'll try to, I'll cut the tech speak there, but it's... I think, yeah, you just about lost... Yeah. It's pretty All interesting. Anyone who wants to ask me questions about InformaCam, I'll do my best and point you in yeah, the right I'll be direction. Yeah, happy to talk about that after. No, please. You look like you want to ask a question. Oh, you were like looking around. I was like, okay, I'll just call on you. Oh, I mean, I think just, just to tell you a, a few more things about StoryMaker, just to be really clear, is that, you know, it is open source, it is free. Um, we are looking at, at trying to figure out ways that other folks, you know, could, like, so for example, Rob is a media trainer. Uh, he's selling his content via his app. There's really no reason if he wanted to that he couldn't put them in the same format that we have and access our users and reach them. And I think that's one of the things we need to figure out, you know, both for ourselves to, you know, create revenue for us, but also for users, and to encourage more users. Because right now, you know, it's our team is developing curricular material, and you might think our work is really great, but there's a lot of people doing curricular material and media training material, and, and we'd like to have users to have access to all of that. Um, also, I think we, we noted earlier that, you know, the, the content, you control the, the path of the content and where you publish it. Um, and then for folks who are running like a private system, you have the ability currently to upload content to a private server for your team. You don't have to put the content onto YouTube or SoundCloud. Isn't that really the market for the, the finished packages? Probably the most new talent are going to want microphone Sorry, sir. I'm going to use microphone. They're streaming. I'll use my microphone voice. Yes, thank you. Um, so who really does want finished packages? Maybe communities to tell their own stories, start their own media channels? Is that what you're finding in I rural communities smaller. and NGOs? Anyone else who wants to basically do their yeah, own content smaller. marketing uh, storytelling? I would say people who are not, like the, a good way to look at it in terms of where the distinction is, is who is really interested in editorial control of the content. When you have anything close to someone who's thinking about it, from a very strictly editorial perspective, that's the more that someone wants that, the more that they're going to want the raw content. Right. And but people so who have, for, five, the, for so the actual storyteller, the story maker, right. as the person, right. they're probably really more interested in doing packages or try, try, yeah, or exactly. Thinking and I that think might be fun to try. Could right. I even do it? Yeah. Right. Right. And there's you know the, there's also this question of of you know money. Why is somebody who already has the skills going to, and, and already has a YouTube channel they can build themselves and make their own money, going to give you at a news agency their work for free. But there's a whole lot more people in the world who don't have those skills yet, who are interested, who have, you know, it might be enough just to be online. I mean, what we, we were doing a lot of work. to get work. a job. Yeah, right. As they a, they need to develop skills to then get a, a paying job. 
or you know during the sort of Arab Spring, we were doing a lot of work in the Middle East. We found everybody just wanted to send their video to Al Jazeera, and you tried to make the point that well, Al Jazeera is only going to air like this much content per day of all the content, but if you put it on YouTube or created a channel, with a group, you would have more ability to access. But they don't. They just want to put it on Al Jazeera because that's what you know. It's on television. That's what they know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like like okay. So for example. Five years ago, I helped set up a, a network of uh, kind of rural village journalists, and they were using the, uh, the ZIA, the, the Kodak, it's kind of like the flip camera, um, but different market. And they would shoot the content in some rural village, go to an internet cafe, burn the content to a DVD, write out a rough script, email the rough script from the internet cafe, and by India Post, mail the DVD to a central location to assemble, edit, and upload because there's just no ability to do it now. You know, now, yeah, this is a fancy version, but like, you can do all that stuff now on the mobile phone and upload it as long as there's 3G access. And so that's, you know, we've got a lot of interest from those folks who are, yeah, they're NGOs, they're smaller media houses, but that's a part of it, you know? Um, and I do think if we can build enough a user base of, of storytellers that there will be interest from news agencies, because it'll just make sense. Nobody else is asking questions. <laughs> Nobody else is. Please. Anybody? No? Okay. Um, first of all, yeah, you should have led my question earlier that I think this is a great tool. Um, Thank you. I think there's a, a huge amount of opportunity here because a ultimately it's sort of the gateway <laughs> drug to video storytelling. Um, and once people get into it, and you know, I see a future of journalism where there's more journalists uh, more journalism coming out of un unexpected places. So, um, you know, so this is just an opportunity to make that happen. Um, my question would be then, is there an opportunity to level up, if you will, to the kind of training, right? So there's a curriculum based on, I don't know, Multimedia 100, and then there's right. a curriculum for Multimedia 101, so that there's an opportunity to just get better, and then also to challenge the intermediate folks to you know, make it even better, right? I mean, you don't want to, you don't want every piece of content looking the same after a while. Right. You want some innovation to happen. I was wondering if you, how you guys thought that through. Well, I think one of the, sorry, did you, okay, so the, the, and so my initial answer is, I think the way that that's going to work is when different media houses kind of set their criteria to say, well, if we want breaking news from the Middle East, we want to make sure, like we want to only look at the story maker users who have actually published 10 stories and have taken these lessons and have passed them. Like, okay, we can if set different parameters as far as sorting the content that people are creating without even controlling the content ourselves, letting people own it. And so that's where I think setting these staged lessons that grew, like grow into each other, there's always going to be a place for Storymaker to make our own lessons. And I think that that's a really big potential for us as an organization to grow. Additionally, I also think there's going to be people who are gonna want that more traditional education approach, or like, they're gonna want the stamp from the New York Times. And that's not gonna come next week, but that's something that like we would love to have at some point that someone could say, hey, I took all of these classes from the New York Times. Or, or, or from the University of Oregon. Right. You could, you could, I don't know why I'm mentioning that. And, and, and Andrew's a that? professor at the University of Oregon. Uh, but I mean, there's no reason a university couldn't reach, you know, 10,000 students without having them in the classroom uh, right. just by creating those, you know, whether it's for free or, or not. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's going to come along, right? Either our team is going to start at the very least creating our own, like, advanced lessons that people pay for, or helping you or someone else create those lessons and pay for them, or someone else is gonna build that tool if, if there's a market for it, right? Um, so that's one piece of it, definitely. The, the other thing is, is, you know, we're just trying to work with, with more and more partners and see how people are using mobile, and, and let, you know, we need to stop deciding what we do with this by what we did with that, you know, and the other giant cameras 20 years ago. There's a lot of different ways to tell visual stories. And just because currently, you know, you can't take, uh, you can't, I can't interview Steve, shoot a bunch of video of Steve doing stuff and lay the interview under it on my mobile phone, doesn't mean I can't make a compelling story about Steve's work, right? 
And I think that's a big thing, that is, is we need to see it as an opportunity, right, to create different approaches to storytelling. And still do the other ones too, because this is getting better. I'm gonna be able to shoot all my stuff here, edit it on a laptop or a tablet or whatever. If you have iOS, you know, the iMovie app works pretty good. But that's more complicated than just having kind of a package you put together, lay a narration under it. We're seeing really interesting stuff happening just with that, just where, where the story is really led by the reporter's voice. And one of the sort of things that I think terrifies people about Storymaker is, which is opposite for most other apps where you create content, is if you look at Vine, you look at Snapchat, you look at Facebook's Riff, all these new things, they focus on restricting everything and you learn your creativity within that restraint. And right now, the way Storymaker works, it's kind of the opposite, which is we're saying, hey, we've got flexibility, which is interesting to people, but doesn't challenge them creatively. But as we develop the path format a little bit stronger, we can actually bring those constraints into different formats. So the idea of saying, hey, this is a Vine path. You only have six seconds, deal with it. If you want 15 clips, okay, that's fine, but you can't break out of six seconds. Those are other ways that I think it's really interesting to sort of say, okay, and as an educator, it's like, okay, well, guess what? For your first thing, you can only use three clips because if you fill this thing with 15 clips, you're not gonna know what you're doing and we can't talk about it. Like, we're gonna keep it really rigid. And the, the underlying tech that we have there that was what we basically built in 2014. Thank you. And um, we, you know, we've barely scratched the surface in terms of really saying, hey, this is what a path is and what it can do. Um, you know, we can display all sorts of text. We can do quizzes. We can do media creation. And we can do a lot with that. So I think it's really exciting, you know, to think about all the different ways that we can bring it together. I've got a question about assumptions. Um, mm -hmm. When you guys were working on the app originally, you probably had some assumptions about how it was going to be used by people in the field. Uh, yes. How, what were some of the examples where your assumptions were farthest from actually the situation on the ground? <sighs> Do you wanna go first? <laughs> I'll go first if you don't. I mean, I think, I think it's even a little bit more complicated than that, right? We, we had assumptions about the product the developers were going to deliver to us and the features we'd have access to. Um, and it wasn't until very far down the road of the first chunk of funding that we realized I, uh, we were very limited in terms of what we could do, right? Um, we started out with a five clip story, which is okay, five seems like a good round number. Do a video, photo, audio. And then we found out that, well, you only have five boxes of information. So if you want to make a 25 clip story for advanced users, it's still gonna, the goal is still gonna be the exact same information. So you can't like create a discussion story with three different interview questions, uh, you know. And that, in some ways, it was, was n uh, nice to be limited by, you know. And then we built a new thing, thinking we were gonna throw all that stuff out and later realized well, some of that stuff we threw out, like having a simple five shot story would make it a lot more easy to use, you know, in the short term. So it's like, okay, we needed to do both. Uh, as far as users, I mean, I don't know, what, what are the assumptions? Oh, well, I mean, this is slightly, I mean, this is related enough that I just think it's kind of interesting, which is uh, we knew that we wanted to enable narration of a story we were like, oh, that's a cool idea. We should definitely let people do narration. Uh, it was, we had so many technical hurdles that it ended up getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And our lead developer at the time then finally realized like, oh, crap, I have to deliver this thing tomorrow and there's no narration. So eight hours later and you know a couple of cans of Coca-Cola, he shipped some very janky code, which worked and basically blew up as everyone's favorite feature. And it was one of those things where we're like, everyone really likes this? Like, and they're like, yes, narration is what's awesome. And we're like, okay, cool. And that was something that we knew was important, but we did not expect that there was actually going to be a user demand for it. And it turns out that like, it's one of people's favorite things. And I think what's really exciting about it as a tool that no one else is doing is media create, and it, uh, the best, the closest correlation I can give you are Instagram filters. 
And with Instagram, you take a picture, and then you sit there and you think about what context do I want to put this image in? Do I want to make it look like a 70s photo? Do I want to make it look black and white? And you sit there and you add this secondary layer of context. Narration is the same thing, but you're just using your voice. And you're saying, oh, I want to, well, I didn't, they didn't say that in the interview, so I want to add that. Or, and people just love talking anyway. As you can see, I'm talking too much right now. Um, so I think that's where it's been a really interesting, that, that to me was the most surprise, like the biggest curveball that I would say that came from development. Um, additionally, as just uh, another thing about software development, before this, you know, Brian and I would do media creation and filmmaking with everybody. And I always thought, I was like, oh, this is one of the most complicated, difficult things. I now take that back, and software is so complicated and such a nightmare. And you like make one tiny assumption, and that can come back to bite you, and you will regret it. And it's, it's insane. So um, yeah, software is very complicated. Another question, what's your favorite story that's returned from, and, and can, do you have it on that laptop to show us? Uh, I do. Um, your battery's dead. I think my battery's dead, though, and I, which I am not copping out. It, literally, that's why that went away. Can you reenact it for us? Um, well, I'll just give you a very brief, uh, brief example of it, but the, um, there's a, one of our trainers, or one of our trainees in Iraq shot this amazing video about a boar hunt because the boar had gorged a uh, local. So everyone got together to go out and shoot the boar. And they did. And then they went back to the guy's house who got you know, gouged and they like told him about it. And there's this crazy interview of like him laying on a couch and he's like, that's awesome. Um, and it's just crazy because it's these guys, it it's, was shot in Kurdistan during, you know, in the last six months while everything that's been insane with ISIS is going on. But daily life continues, and someone still gets gorged by a boar, and a couple people get some guns out and decide, we're going to go kill that thing. And like that's a story no one would ever see or hear about if it wasn't for things like social media, because that's not going to make it to the homepage of CNN. But it's an awesome story. So Well, and it's, I mean, it, it, it feels like... We, we could be, we have the opportunity to be approaching an age where we can record and capture and index more of the world's stories rather than less, right? Like I think we had been for the last 50 years going towards a place of where individual local stories and oral history was becoming less and less because everything was being centralized. Now, if, if we have the tool in the right hands, we have the ability to get more, you know, we can hope. Um, and I will say also that, that there's no greater risk than, than success, you know, like in terms of like things we found as failures, like, you know, trying to shoot, capture, edit a video very quickly on the phones that we're using run out of space. And we didn't think about the way to like, oh, we need to make sure it's really, we still don't have a great solution for, for indexing and clearing that at scale. Like if users start just creating stories every day, and it's like those things that you take for granted as somebody who is a media maker and a filmmaker that you don't realize, like you have to like add that piece of the skill also to the new user. Yeah, Educating someone on media management, that sentence alone would be a very expensive grant. So it's like, yeah, yeah these are, these are a, there's a lot, of, a lot of very big challenges still in front of us, but yeah. As far as uh, my favorite story, I was running a workshop I guess a year ago, maybe two, two years ago, in uh, southern Libya. And in the span of like three days, the guy went to make a story about a, there was a warehouse with all brand new medical equipment that was just sitting in a place. And they had a clinic where all the equipment barely functioned. And so he was making a story that he was like, why is this happening? And he just went to interview the guy who was in charge of making sure the new clinic got built. And like the next day, I had to like redo the story because that guy like it struck the fear of God in him so much. He's just like a, like he just had a mobile phone, but he was like, oh, somebody's watching. I have to like actually get to work on this. And so then it went from being a like, what the hell is why is this happening to a here's a success story. Like now the clinic is like finally after three months, it's moving forward. And I think that's that's another thing that you know we often take for granted if we're only thinking about it as journalists and new, as news agency. Yes, we can do a lot of work shining light and power, but even in like very small towns and things, maybe more. He hadn't even published it yet. Like he literally just showed up and been like, "I want to ask you about this thing." And the guy was like, 
wait, what? And then he called him the next day and was like, hey, I, I'm, I'm, can you come back and like, can we do another interview? So I think, you know, I want to see that happen more. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming and thank the rest of you for sticking around. Um, we'll be here for the rest of the, the conference as well. Don't hesitate if anyone wants to come up and ask us any questions or, yeah. Um, thank you again for coming. <laughs>